Okay, so um, I'd like to welcome everyone this morning uh, to the Puget Sound Regional Council Joint Board Workshop on Building a Foundation for Racial Equity, Institutional and Structural Racism. Um, thank you all for joining us. Uh, the weather isn't exactly delightful out there. Uh, I hope you all stayed safe through the snow. So um, I'm just going to kick us off with a few talking points. Um, we all know there's a, there are inequities across our region. Uh, we, we know that. Uh, data shows time and time again that there are clear differences in how people experience the systems that we help manage and shape based on their race. I mean, we know this, right? As leaders, we need not only to be aware of these differences, but we need to equip ourselves with tools to improve the lives of all our region's residents, everyone. Uh, as we work to develop Vision 2050, we regularly heard from many people across the region that equity should be a top priority in the plan. And now we are starting to build equity considerations into our planning and other efforts that we do at Puget Sound Regional Council. Um, and it's, which is really critical to build the foundation that scopes more equitable systems across our regions. We have to do the structural work. So today we're here because we believe that together we can build better and more resilient region with more opportunities for all our residents. Equitable, pol equitable policies and plans are critical to achieve these outcomes. And workshops like these can develop a baseline. You know, we have, we've been all stumbled into that trap of understanding what, what the criteria are. What, what is the baseline? You know, it, what are we trying to define? How are we trying to, and how does that definition allow us to move forward? As PSRC board members, it's important that we take time to build a deeper and shared understanding of those baselines, those concepts, so that we can move forward jointly with common understanding. And what is structural racism? So that we can not only identify it, um, but we can collaborate with one another to effectively address it. Our planning policies, our uh, allocation of resource policies, so that we can effectively address it. So with that, uh, I'd like to uh, turn it over to our wonderful staff. Do we want to do some introductions here or a roll call? In any no? Okay, then I'm going to um, I'm going to turn it over to Ben Ben Bacenta, and he's going to lead us through this process. Actually, um, I, I I wish I could, but I could not ne never do it as well as Charles Patton, who is our lead for. Um, Program Manager for Equity Policy and Initiatives. And so, Charles, um, I will leave it in your very capable hands to be our Thank guide you, today. Charles. Appreciate it. No problem. My pleasure. Thank you for the introduction. I'm, I'm going to share my screen if you give me a second, and I'll get us started. I think you all should be seeing that. If I get a big, if you give me a thumbs up, that looks okay. All right. Um, so good morning. Uh, thank you all for, for joining us today. Thank you all for being here. I appreciate you making the time. As you can see, today's presentation will be on structural racism. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about, um, as Vice President Erickson mentioned, what this term means, uh, how it has impacted our region historically. We'll also talk about how it continues to impact our region today um, and what we can do to address it. So today's presentation, I hope that you will find it very interactive. We've been Included some Zoom poll questions for you. Uh, we've also included some audio and video clips. So uh, I'll, I'll dive right in. So um, before I dive into today's uh, equity topic, I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page uh, with, what, with what equity means. Once again, vision defines equity as when all people have the means to attain the resources and opportunities that improve their quality of life and enable them to reach their full potential when differences in life outcomes cannot be predicted by race, class, or any other identity, when communities of color, historically marginalized communities, and those affected by poverty are engaged in decision-making processes, planning, and policy-making. So over the next uh, two to three quarters, uh, I will take some deeper dives into each of these dimensions of racism, as I've mentioned in past presentations. Last session, as you all know, uh, we covered the topic of internalized racism or, or implicit bias. 
Um, and before I move forward, I'm going to have to stop sharing my screen because I remember that I didn't do one critical thing. Um, and I'll try to do it now. I need to share my sound for some of those video clips. And then we should be good to go. All right, back to where I was at. Sorry about that. So uh, today we will be addressing institutional and structural racism, as I mentioned earlier. As you'll recall, institutional racism is defined as discriminatory policies and practices of particular institutions. That's the key word there, particular institutions, singular institutions, such as the Department of Housing that produce in inequitable outcomes for people of color and advantages for white people. Structural racism is defined as the cumulative effects of history culture, ideology, in the interacting interactions of multiple institutions and policies that systematically pri privilege white people and disadvantage people of color. So the key difference between those two terms, once again, is that institutional racism is focused on singular institutions, while structural racism is focused on multiple institutions. Both are creating inequitable outcomes for people of color. Today's goals, I want to develop a deeper and shared understanding of inst institutional and structural racism, as Vice President Erickson mentioned earlier. Uh, hopefully that will allow us in the future to have more robust conversations on the topic of equity and consequently collaborate more effectively as we seek to uh, incorporate equity more and more in the work that we do. Uh, before we get into the meat of today's topic, I'd like you to think about the last time that you moved. Uh, for some people, it may have been this past summer. Some of you may have been years and years ago. But if you could reflect back on that time, um, and what was the most important factor for your decision? So, Catherine, can we put that on the slide for or the, the screen for folks? Thank you, Catherine. And if you could just fill out that poll for us, appreciate it. I see some uh, responses trickling in. about halfway there. Okay, Kath, I think we're about there. I think we can go ahead and share the results now. So it looks like uh, we have our results. And for most of our board members, it was the proximity to jobs and proximity to quality schools that were the most important factors are very, very interesting. Thank you for sharing uh, those um, or sharing your responses. We can go ahead and close that out now. Thank you, Catherine. So as you all are well aware, where people live is informed by policies that we at PSRC help shape, which determines people's proximity to good schools their proximity to transportation, their proximity to employment, factors that are very important for them and their families and the trajectory of their lives. Each of these slices um, of the pie that I'm sharing on this slide represent different institutions and they work together to essentially create structures. For example, some people may not have moved to their home if it wasn't close to that good school system. Uh, for others, they might not have access to a good school system because they can't afford a home in a neighborhood that has high quality schools. And as a result of being limited to poor quality schools, their children may have limited employment opportunities in the future. Or they may live in a neighborhood that has limited transit options, which limits their access to jobs. So here you can see how these institutions are working together with one another to create a structure that influences decisions and potentially the trajectory of their lives. As an agency, our policies have essentially helped shape this structure. Today, we'll be taking a holistic view of the structure that shapes residents' lives. We'll take a look at the history of racist policies in our region and how it continues to determine outcomes for people of color in our region. So now that we're on the same page about what institutions are and what structures are, let's explore institutional and structural racism. This refers to singular institutions in the case of institutional racism or multiple institutions in the case of structural racism working together to perpetuate racially inequitable outcomes. These can be neutral policies that don't even mention race, but perpetuate and exacerbate racial disparities. And these racially inequitable outcomes can even exist if there's good intent 
behind the policies or an absence of overtly racist actors. So don't need to mention race, don't need to be um, purposefully being racist for that policy or that practice to create inequitable outcomes. And if it does, it is a form of institutional or structural racism. So here you are looking at a timeline of racist policies in this country and in the central Puget Sound region. This obviously is not an exhaustive list of all the events of structural racism um, across our history, um, but it gives you a sense of what this history has looked like for us, from the Donation Land Claims Act to more modern forms of racial discrimination in the form of mortgage lending discrimination and home appraisal discrimination. These essentially serve as a chain of discriminatory policies that continue to cause race to predict life outcomes, inform the trajectory of people's lives, and determine who has access to what resources in our region. So let's start with the 1600s to the 1860s portion of our timeline. This serves as the foundation of structural racism in this country. And in this region, we have the enslavement of African Americans, which most of you are familiar with. We have the American Indian displacement and genocide, which most of you are also familiar with. And then we have the Donation Land Claims Act and the Homestead Act, which are not as well known, um, but very critical to creating racial disparities in our region. So uh, the Donation Land Claims Act started in 1850, uh, allowed white male citizens to claim about 320 acres of land taken from Native Americans in the Oregon Territory. At the time, the Oregon Territory included the state of Washington. If you were a white married couple, you could double your acreage, essentially, uh, moving from 320 acres to 640 acres, which is essentially the equivalent of 640 football fields or a square mile of land. The Donation Land Claims Act did not last long, moved from 1850 to 1853, but interesting enough, it served as a model for the Homestead Act in 1862, which offered white residents similar amounts of land across the country. So it was essentially the blueprint um, for land giveaways to white citizens all across the country. Uh, white families obviously were able to develop wealth from this land and that wealth allowed them to pass down resources and opportunities from generation to generation to generation. And I have a video that I would like to share with you that kind of captures this idea of intergenerational transfer of wealth from the Homestead Act to today. And all throughout history, we've seen how whiteness has shaped public policy. So if you think about uh, the Homestead Act, one of the biggest quote unquote welfare programs in the history of the United States, we didn't call it a handout. We didn't call it welfare. We called it nation building. Uh, in the 1930s and 40s, the FHA programs, the VA loans in the 40s and 50s, the GI Bill, all of these programs which were in theory open to everyone, but in practice racially restricted to whites almost exclusively, we didn't call those handouts. We didn't call that welfare. We called that good macroeconomic policy and the building of a middle class. What it did was create opportunities for white working class and lower middle class folks in terms of housing, in terms of job access, in terms of schooling that were completely completely closed off to everyone else. And here we are, 100 years later, 50 years later, 30 years later, living with the legacy of that inequality, none of which has been uprooted, even with the progress that we've made. Because when you have people who have a huge head start, they're able to pass down those advantages to their kids and to their kids and to their kids. And so those disparities actually end up, in terms of wealth and assets, end up growing over time. And before I move forward, I just want to get um. Okay, if we can hear that well, is that, could you hear that, Ben? Yeah, we can hear it in here, Charles. Great, perfect, thank you. So uh, that last part of the video, I think is critical to understanding the influence of historical policies like the Homestead Act, as well as redlining and urban renewal, which we'll get to a little later in today's presentation. The impact of these historical policies on our current disparities. I have some clips from Darity and Mullen's um, book entitled From Here to Equality that I think will expound on this point of intergenerational transfer of wealth from the Homestead Act to today a little more. Equality is provided by a close analysis of wealth disparity in this country. Wealth is the best single indicator of the cumulative impact of white racism over time. Wealth 
The difference between what we own and what we owe, or the difference between the value of our assets and our debts, or the net value of our property, is the economic measure that best captures individual, family, and household well-being. Wealth serves as a primary indicator of economic security. Wealthier families are better positioned to finance elite independent school and college education, access capital to start a business, finance expensive medical procedures, reside in higher amenity neighborhoods, exert political influence through campaign financing, purchase better counsel if confronted with an expensive legal system, leave a bequest, and or withstand financial hardship resulting from any number of emergencies. Wealth provides financial agency over one's life. Simply put, wealth gives individuals and families choice. It provides economic security to take risks and shield against financial loss. Data from the 2016 Survey of Consumer Finances indicates that median black household net worth, $17,600, is only one-tenth of white net worth, $171,000. That means, on average, that for every dollar the middle white household holds in wealth, measured by assets like homes, cash, savings, and retirement funds, the middle black household possesses a mere 10 cents. Among black households with positive net worth, there is a greater reliance on home ownership as a source of wealth. Gifts of Southern Homestead and Homestead Act land enriched more than 1.6 million white families, both native-born and immigrant. By the year 2000, the estimate of the number of adult descendants of those original land grant recipients was 46 million people, about a quarter of the U.S. adult population. The key point is that white parents, on average, can provide their children with wealth-related intergenerational advantages to a far greater degree than black parents. When parents offer gifts to help children buy a home, avoid student debt, or start a business, those children are more able to retain and build on their wealth over their own lifetimes. We examine the historic... So here we can see how there are um, these large racial wealth disparities, as was noted in the audio clip, for every one dollar a white family has, a black family has about 10 cents. And once again, much of that racial wealth gap is rooted in the Homestead Act. Over 1.6 million white families received land as a result of this policy. And in 2000, about a quarter of the U.S. adult population, a quarter of the U.S. adult population benefited from the wealth and the intergenerational advantages of this one policy, once again, allowing them to pay for college, live in communities rich in resources, and also leave an inheritance. Gift. So I have a couple questions related to this topic. Um, so we could put those on the slide really quickly. Thank you, Catherine. First question for you, how much land could a white married couple claim under the donation land claims act? That's our first question. And the second question we have for you, how many Americans are the descendants of white families that received land from the Homestead Act? So I'll give you a few uh, seconds or maybe 30 seconds to a minute to answer that. It shouldn't take you too long. See, responses are trickling in. Go halfway through. Almost there. Okay, Catherine, I think we can go ahead and share those responses. Great, for the first, for the first question, looks like um, most people said 640 football fields, had a few people said 320, had a few say 100. Uh, and the answer is 640 acres. So if you answer D, you were absolutely correct. Moving on to question two, how many Americans are the, are the descendants of white families that received land from the Homestead Act? A uh, few people said 10%. Uh, a uh, few people said, uh, most people said 25%, had a few that said A, uh, a couple that said D, and the correct answer is C, 25%. So if you answered uh, A, oh, I'm sorry, if you, yeah, if you answered yeah, 640 football fields and 25%, you got both of those correct. Uh, so very, very uh, good if you were able to do that. 
Um, so mo the wealth from that much land being passed down to that many people, I think is just really astounding uh, to think about, has huge implications, obviously, as was mentioned in the audio and video clip for creating wealth, the racial wealth gap that we see today. Uh, so thank you for submitting those responses. I think we can stop sharing that and I'll move on to the next slide. So moving on to the 1870s to the 1960s, I have a few videos I like to share that capture how disparities from the previous decades were perpetuated uh, with the Tacoma method, the redlining and restrictive covenants, Japanese internment, as well as urban renewal. So I'll get us started with the Tacoma method. Welcome to how we got here, a history of 88. This settlement The road to justice and equity for the Chinese who lived in Tacoma near the turn of the century has been long delayed, fueled by anti-immigrant sentiment of the Federal Chinese Sorry about that. Exclusion Act of 1882. A major event in Tacoma altered the course of its history. Known as the Chinese Expulsion or Tacoma Method, Prominent government and community leaders engineered the forced removal of the entire Chinese population on November 3, 1885. Chinese people began migrating to the United States in the 1850s and 60s to work in gold mining and to build the Transcontinental Railroad. In fact, in 1870, 2,000 Chinese were hired to work on the Northern Pacific Railroad line from Kalama in the southwestern corner of the Washington Territory to Tacoma, the western terminus of the line. As anti-Chinese sentiment sprung up all across the United States, Tacoma local white leaders felt that the U.S. government was not adequately enforcing the Chinese Exclusion Act. Economic downturns in the area exacerbated fears of white residents that their economic well-being was threatened by cheap foreign labor and that the Chinese in Tacoma were not assimilating into American culture. These leaders decided to take matters into their own hands. The Tacoma City Council passed ordinances forbidding the employment of Chinese people by the city of Tacoma. Mayor Jacob Weisbach, a German immigrant, began hosting public meetings around the city to consider the Chinese question. Eventually, these leaders resolved to methodically expel Chinese residents from Tacoma. In the weeks leading up to the expulsion, Chinese were told to get out of town. Weisbach and his Committee of 15 circulated pledge cards to employers and consumers in Tacoma. These pledge cards promised to boycott Chinese workers and shops. Tacoma had two newspapers at that time and both committed to publishing the names of any white person who refused to sign a card, further stoking anti-Chinese sentiment. The Committee of 15 delivered notices to the Chinese, ordering them to leave Tacoma within 30 days. At 9 a.m., on the morning of November 3rd, 1885, a whistle blew at the local foundry and about 500 Tacoma residents, brandishing clubs and pistols, descended on the homes and businesses of Chinese residents who had remained in the city despite frequent threats and warnings. The residents were told to gather their belongings and forced to march in the rain from downtown Tacoma to the train station in Lakewood, where they were sent to Portland. When the Chinese residents left their homes and businesses, rioters looted them and eventually burned them down. The Chinese expulsion made... So uh, here we can see that at that time, right, white residents felt that their economic well-being was being threatened uh, by Chinese residents. And in response, the Tacoma City Council passes this ordinance forbidding hiring Chinese residents. And also the residents of that area boycotted Chinese workers as well as their businesses. Uh, Chinese residents were often were ordered to, to leave essentially within a, a 30 day window of time. Um, those that remained were violently removed from their homes and watched their homes burn to the ground. This did not only happen uh, in Tacoma, this 
actually sparked similar tactics across uh, the Pacific Northwest as well as the Western United States. Made uh, have another video for you related to redlining. I'll play that now. In the Great Depression, homes have been foreclosed by the millions. And one of the ways that the federal government thought to get banks back into business was to develop a set of maps that showed what were seen as the best neighborhoods where their mortgages would be safe and the worst. So the age and the condition of housing was supposed to be the major criteria, as well as the income of residents. But the other criteria, and the one that's been most controversial and damaging in the long run, had to do with race. So in Seattle, any neighborhood that allowed residency by non-whites was automatically considered part of the red zone. Redlining told the banks that loans would be risky in, say, the central district, mortgages were hard to get, and families who were affected were deprived of the ability to accumulate wealth through property ownership over the generations. That legacy is still very much with us quite starkly today. So some takeaways from this video um, that I'll just briefly highlight. Redlining maps designed to show where households would be essentially denied mortgage loans. Uh, this played a huge role, as we saw in the video, in denying loans to communities of color, made it very difficult for them to purchase homes, and consequently, they were less able to develop well. Uh, in addition to redlining, we have restrictive covenants that many of you are familiar with, kind of served as a complementary practice in this housing space, limiting where people of color could purchase a home and even rent an apartment. So here you can see actual language from restrictive covenants in our region limiting rental and home ownership opportunities in various communities to white residents. Recently, uh, during an executive board meeting, Commissioner Bachman uh, shared a story about his family's experience with restrictive covenants in West Seattle, and I'll, I'll briefly share that with you right now. I like the other comments, they're, they're perfect. I, I give you a real life uh, story. Uh, my parents bought a place in West Seattle right after World War II, and in it were some CCNRs that said, do not sell your property to uh, people of color, um, Asians and or American Indians. My father was a legal tribal member of the Kootenai tribe out of the Flathead, Montana. I wasn't allowed to talk about our heritage until about 1964 after the Civil Rights Act. So it, it, even though the, the language was probably meaningless, it terrified my parents, who neither one of them were high school graduates, but it still, it, it put a stress on them. And uh, so I think uh, letters or language of encouragement is very important. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's an amazing story. And I, and I think it was replicated all over our region. I know those covenants existed in my city as well. Any other thoughts? Another topic I want to uh, touch on from this period is uh, Japanese internment. On December 7th, 1941, the Empire of Japan launched an attack on the U.S. naval base at Pearl Harbor. In the following months, hundreds of thousands of Japanese Americans were rounded up and sent to internment camps under suspicion of disloyalty to the United States. But the feelings that paved the road to internment began long before the attack. For more than 80 years, Asian immigrants were viewed as economic threats, spurring various laws that effectively banned them from the country. For those who made it to America, the lingering resentment culminated after Pearl Harbor. Motivated by vocal outcries from politicians and military officials, FDR signed Executive Order 9066, empowering the U.S. Army to designate areas from which any or all persons may be excluded. He later formed the War Relocation Authority to establish 10 permanent camps, housing nearly 120,000 Japanese Americans, mostly from the Western United States. Two-thirds of those interned were native-born American citizens. 
With only six days to dispose of their possessions, residents were forced to sell their belongings and even their homes for small sums of money. Internment camps were often situated in isolated deserts, prone to harsh weather, and surrounded by barbed wire and guard towers. Within the barracks, internees lived in small one-room apartments with little privacy and constant surveillance. They were only given a standard army cot, blankets, and a small heating stove. Despite these difficult living conditions, internees tried to establish a sense of community, creating newspapers, schools, churches, and farms. Even in the face of persecution, young men came forth to join the military. Nearly 33,000 Japanese Americans served during World War II, many of whom became highly decorated for their valor in battle. Yet as the war continued, public opinion worsened against Japanese Americans. Only 35% of the country thought they should be allowed home once the war was over. This sentiment kept the camps open for over three years. On December 17, 1944, the government announced that Japanese American evacuees could return to their homes. When they did return, they found their homes looted and their possessions gone. With work almost impossible to come by, many fell homeless and destitute. At the time, the federal government offered no assistance for those attempting to rebuild their lives. It would take over 40 years before President Ronald Reagan signed the Civil Liberties Act of 1988, paying reparations to each victim of internment. No payment can make up for those lost years. So what is most important in this bill has less to do with property than with honor. For here, we admit a wrong. Here, we reaffirm our commitment as a nation to equal justice under the law. So uh, here we can see Japanese Americans sent to internment camps after the attack on Pearl Harbor. Many residents unfortunately forced to sell their belongings and homes for small sums of money. And those that returned um, after that three year time in, in these internment camps often found their homes looted. Uh, one last video for this section of our timeline that I'll play really quickly for you. <laughs> While many de jure segregation policies aim to keep African Americans far from white residential areas, public officials also shifted African American populations away from downtown business districts so that white commuters, shoppers, and business elites would not be exposed to black people. This was accomplished with slum clearance. One slum clearance tool was the construction of the federal interstate highway system. In many cases, state and local governments, with federal acquiescence, designed interstate highway routes to destroy urban African-American communities. In the 1950s, there was a white middle-class neighborhood. Uh, so here we can see that slum clearance is kind of a, a synonym, synonym for urban renewal. Um, it's kind of used to ship people of color away from downtown areas while, so that white patrons will feel more comfortable. Um, shopping at these areas be more likely to shop in these downtown areas so they, weren't be, so they wouldn't be exposed to people of color. Uh, one tool of urban renewal was the construction of highways um, that destroyed communities of color in the process. And we saw that in our region with I-5, uh, the construction of I-5 and the expansion of I-90. Um, those uh, families that lived along those highways where they were being constructed often found their homes destroyed in the process. If their homes were not destroyed in the process, uh, they were more likely to be exposed to emissions and have be disproportionately uh, uh, into these health issues that would come from the, that exposure that they would be exposed to, and as a result um, of that proximity to highways, which was also very unfortunate. So uh, I have a few questions for you related to this portion of our timeline. Uh, we can put that on the slide for everybody, Catherine. First question I have for you, what was a consequence of the Tacoma method? Second question, what is redlining? And the third question, how many years were Japanese residents forced to live in internment camps? I'll give you a few moments to answer those questions.
starting to trickle in a little bit more. A third of the way there, here they come. Halfway there. people a few more seconds to answer. All right, I think we can share the results, Catherine. Uh, so it looks like for that first question, uh, what was the consequence of the Tacoma method? Uh, all the results that came in said E, and all of you are correct. It is all of the above. A Tacoma method, method forbid hiring Chinese residents, boycotted Chinese workers and businesses. Chinese residents violently removed from their homes, and they were also uh, forced to watch their homes be burned to the ground. Uh, in regards to what is redlining, had a few people say uh, B, had a, a few people say, or one person said C, uh, most people said A, and most people were correct. It is a process. Uh, for uh, drawing red lines on the map showing where uh, mortgages would, would and would not be, um, uh, where, where lenders would and would not make loans. Moving on to the third question. Mom, most people said three years, had a few people say five years. The answer is three years. Uh, many Japanese, um, uh, Japanese residents were forced to live in internment camps for three years um, after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Um, so if you answered, uh, E, A, and B, you got all of those correct. Nicely done. Thank you for submitting those responses and I'll move us along. So lastly, we have the 1970s to today. I have a few short videos I'd like to share. Uh, you'll note that nothing here is overtly or explicitly racist during this period in time, uh, but these practices disproportionately impacted communities of color, which once again is a key component of institutional and structural racism is the policy or practice leading to inequitable outcomes. So I'll play our, our first video. This four bedroom home in the hills of Marin, north of San Francisco, offers lots of light, water views, a school right down the hill. So the house used to end right here. Owners Paul Austin and Tanisha Tate Austin knew it was worth at least $1.3 million based on a 2019 appraisal. But looking to borrow as the housing market heated up, Paul met a new appraiser and showed her around. And what was the number value? You open up that piece of paper and what is it? Oh, $998,000. Less so, than a million. Less than a million less dollars. A million. Which means almost $400,000 less than yes. the appraisal you'd gotten a year earlier. Yes. And so they applied for a new appraisal. But this time, I'm going to guarantee that I'm, I'm going to get the, the appraisal that my house is supposed to get. And in the United States, what is your best guarantee of getting the best rate possible? Being if white. Being white. So they worked to erase themselves from their own home. All of our art, took that away, um, pictures of our family, mm -hmm. um, anything that, you know, would resemble that this home belongs to a black family. Just, you know, just grabbed it all, put it all in the shed, put it all away. And they asked a white friend to stand in when the new appraiser arrived. So this time you open the paper and it says what? Um, 1.482. Yes. $500,000 difference. <laughs> Imagine what that money can do for a family. That's seed money for a business. That's a second home you could rent out. That's college tuition. Now, imagine this whole community misses out on those opportunities. It shows that this is a far larger problem than this one address. Carla Duffy, a homeowner in Indianapolis, told NBC's Priscilla Thompson about using a similar tactic. I met with two of my girlfriends. Both are married to white men, and I was like, okay, I need to borrow one of y'all husbands. <laughs> Her appraisal came back at double the value. A survey of studies of racial disparities in the U.S. mortgage market found that discrimination inhibits upward social mobility of minorities and exacerbates large racial disparities in wealth because home equity is crucial for building wealth. In fact, this community, known as Marin City, was held back for decades. When Paul's family moved here from the south to work in the shipyards, redlining meant it was the only place in the area where African Americans were allowed to buy a home, while white residents could buy and sell anywhere. Today, Marin City's median income is less than $30,000 a year. Neighboring Mill Valley, a mile away, is nearly three times that. 
in theory, this home should have been your family's escape from that history. Yes. Right. Yes. Like, we shouldn't have to had to repeat what my grandparents had to go through, you know, 50 plus years ago. It's frustrating yeah. because we, we we're not as far alone in America as we think we are. The original. So here we can see how racial bias, which we learned about in our previous session, is rooted in these perceptions developed through these historical racist policies, and it's leading now to racial disparities in home appraisal. This obviously exacerbates racial wealth disparities and subsequently limits opportunities for communities of color. Appraiser. Uh, I want to apologize ahead of time for the simplistic nature of the next two videos um, that I'll be sharing with you, but I do think they do a good job of doing some level setting so that we're all on the same page and setting up some slides I have later in today's presentation. So I'll get this one started. Zoning is a way for communities to separate land by use or form. For example, an area could be dedicated to commercial or industrial use or there could be a restriction on how many housing units can be built. Zoning shapes the places where we live, but it also shapes our lives. Local zoning regulations determine where we can find housing, schools and parks, and who gets to use them. Policymakers initially created zoning codes to protect public health. For example, to stop residents from getting sick from living too close to factories. But from the start, zoning has separated more than just land uses. It has also separated people. In the early 20th century, many communities explicitly used zoning ordinances to racially segregate neighborhoods, effectively declaring that different skin colors were as incompatible as a family's home and a smokestack. By the late 20th century, civil rights legislation outlawed overt housing discrimination, but those explicit racial barriers were quickly replaced by subtler methods. Even today, exclusionary zoning policies that restrict lower cost or higher density housing limit racial and economic diversity and raise housing costs. By driving up housing costs, restrictive zoning can exclude people from equal access to public resources, like schools and parks, and leave lower income workers unable to afford housing close to available jobs. When regions are more economically and racially segregated, everyone loses. Local economies see slower growth, and residents of all races are less upwardly mobile. And finally, despite being created to protect public health, zoning often pushes multifamily buildings closer to highways in areas with higher concentrations of air pollutants. As a result, low-income people and people of color are more likely to live in places that could make them sick. It doesn't have to be this way. When done thoughtfully, zoning can connect people and places, not divide us. Communities across the United States are beginning to re-examine the role of zoning and change the restrictive zoning rules, opening neighborhoods to multifamily housing, walkable densities, and more. For more uh, so here we can see how single-family zoning has essentially replaced redlining at this portion of our timeline, artificially driving up housing prices by limiting uh, access to lower cost, higher density housing in these communities. We can also note uh, how the lack of intergenerational wealth resulting from the Donation Land Claims Act, redlining, urban renewal limits people of, people of color's ability to afford homes in these communities and disproportionately limits people of color's access to schools, their access to parks, their access to jobs, so forth and so on. More uh, One more video on gentrification. Gentrification is constantly being talked about in tax communities. Over the last century, many policies and practices have created racialized patterns of disinvestment in city centers that have left low-income communities of color particularly susceptible to gentrification. From the 1930s through the late 60s, standards set by the federal government and carried out by banks explicitly labeled neighborhoods home to predominantly people of color as risky and unfit for investment. This practice, now known as redlining, meant that people of color were denied access to loans that would enable them to buy or repair homes in their neighborhood. Other housing and transportation policies of the mid-20th century fueled the growth of mostly white suburbs and the exodus of capital from urban centers, in a phenomenon often referred to as white flight. Take the GI Bill as an example. The program guaranteed low-cost mortgage loans for returning World War II soldiers, but discrimination limited the extent to which black veterans were able to purchase homes in the growing suburbs. 
In fact, the Federal Housing Administration largely required that suburban developers agree to not sell houses to black people in order for the developers to access these guaranteed loans. Left behind in central city neighborhoods, low-income households and communities of color bore the brunt of highway system expansion and urban renewal programs, which resulted in the mass clearance of homes, businesses, and neighborhood institutions, and set the stage for widespread public and private disinvestment in the decades that followed. In more recent history, the foreclosure crisis also contributed to neighborhood-level vulnerability to gentrification. In low-income communities of color, disproportionate levels of subprime lending resulted in mass foreclosure, leaving those neighborhoods vulnerable to investors seeking to purchase and flip homes in bulk. Today, both people and capital are flooding back into these historically disinvested neighborhoods. One reason new people are moving into these neighborhoods is because of their relative affordability. In many U.S. cities, the rental market has gotten increasingly expensive, and even moderate income earners are on the hunt for lower housing costs. This means that in some places, they are looking in historically disinvested communities, often the same neighborhoods previous generations left behind during the days of white flight. These neighborhoods are often characterized by older historic housing stock that appeals to new residents and close proximity to city centers, where jobs, restaurants, and art spaces are increasingly locating. Cities are also investing in revitalizing some of these neighborhoods, for example, with improved transit access and infrastructure, in part to draw in newcomers. On the ground, gentrification may look like real estate speculation, with investors flipping properties for large profits, as well as high-end development, and landlords looking for higher-paying tenants, increased investment in neighborhood amenities like transit and parks, changes in land use, for example, from industrial land to restaurants and storefronts, and changes in the character of the neighborhood, as community-run businesses are replaced by businesses catering to new residents' needs. While increased investment in an area can be positive, gentrification is often associated with displacement, which means that in some of these communities, longtime residents are not able to stay to benefit from new investments in housing, healthy food access, or transit infrastructure. Instead, lower income families, often families of color, may find themselves facing rent increases, evictions, or other displacement pressures and left with no other choice but to move to suburban or even exurban areas, far away from their jobs and the businesses and service providers they know. This can mean more time commuting, less time spent at home, and increased isolation, depression, and stress levels. For children, displacement can disrupt educational pathways and generate negative health impacts. Even for long- so here we can see how these historical policies that we just uh, visited throughout that timeline have created these patterns of disinvestment in communities of color and their resulting uh, lack of home ownership and their resulting lack of wealth has left them susceptible to today's gentrification and displacement. Uh, gentrification um, and a lack of anti-displacement strategies can lead to lower income residents being displaced and not being able to enjoy the benefits of new investments being made in their community because of these rent increases. Uh, this displacement, as was mentioned in the video, can separate households from their jobs and their communities, creating longer commutes. It can also lead to businesses and community-based organizations uh, closing because the people that they have served have been displaced. Long time. So a few questions to round out our timeline. Um, and these will, this will be the last portion of our timeline and uh, the last questions from our timeline for today. So we can put those on the slide for everybody. Catherine, that would be fantastic. Thank you very much. True or false, home appraisal discrimination exacerbates racial disparities of wealth created by the Donation Land Claims Act, redlining, so forth and so on further eroding the wealth of communities of color. The second question we have for you, what is a consequence of single family zoning? And then the third question, true or false, displacement is a form of structural racism because although, although none of the policies involved mention race, multiple institutions are working together to perpetuate racially inequitable outcomes. So I'll give you a few moments to answer those. See that they're already being answered as we speak. A third of the way done. Halfway there.
think we're there. So we can go ahead and share those results, Catherine. So for the first question, uh, true was correct and everybody got that one right. Fantastic job there. For the second question, what is the consequence of single family zoning? We had a few people said A, a couple people said B, uh, a few people say D. Uh, the co correct answer is D, all of the above. It does all of those things. Limits availability of lower cost housing, excludes people of color and limits access to high quality schools, parks and jobs. Last question we have for you, true or false? Um, and all of you said true and all of you got that correct. So well done there. And I think we can go ahead and take that off of people's slides and move us along. Sorry about that. I skipped ahead a little bit too much. All right. So the history that I've just walked through with you has essentially laid a foundation of racial disparities that uh, current practices are continuing to perpetuate. So here we can see some of the results of those historical policies and contemporary policies. On the slide, you'll note that two out of three white residents own a home in our region, while only one out of four or a quarter of our native Hawaiian Pacific Islander residents own a home. So here we can see how the wealth advantage is rooted in the Homestead Act redlining, home appraisal discrimination, so forth and so on, have increased the likelihood that white families can make some larger upfront payments on a home, lower their monthly bill, and increase the affordability and their access to a number of different neighborhoods, including even single family neighborhoods at times. In regards to the economy, another topic that our agency touches, white residents, as you can see, earn almost double what American Indian Alaska Native residents earn in our region. This is in part a consequence of the segregation resulting from the Donation Land Claims Act, redlining, single family zoning, so forth and so on, which has limited access to things such as high quality schools, impeding the ability of many students of color to actually compete in the labor market and earn incomes that are comparable to their white counterparts. Now, some may look at those slides and say, isn't this really just about income? Wouldn't we address all of these issues by just focusing on income inequality and not bringing race into this conversation? However, even after controlling for household income, in other words, kind of evaluating differences in household, households that are in the same income category as we've done on this slide, home ownership rates for people of color are much lower than rates for white house, households, especially when you're looking at these lower in moderate income households. So if we solely focused on income, we would not be able to capture these different disparities and would never be able to address the factors that are creating these racial disparities. And I think this really highlights the need to not only focus on income, but also race as well. So some of you may have noticed that disparities like the ones I've just shown you often aren't as wide and often aren't as glaring for Asian Americans. Um, sometimes Asian Americans appear to even surpass their white counterparts for outcomes like income, like the one I just shared with you uh, on that previous slide, which leads some to actually buy into this myth, um, the, mod the model minority myth. Um, and if you're not familiar with the model minority myth, it's, it's essentially when people perceive Asian Americans to be universally successful. But as many of you know, Asian Americans are not a monolithic group, no racial group is, and their success is often a reflection of the resources that they have arrived to our country with. Uh, while some Asian immigrants arrive as refugees with limited resource, resources, others arrive through visa programs and consequently they have more resources. And this difference in resources that they arrive with informs the barriers that they'll likely face in our region and the opportunities that they'll likely have access to. And as you can see, it informs the incomes that they'll likely earn in our region. So if you take a look at the orange bar in the middle of this chart, this represents the median earnings for the, our entire region, regardless of race. And you can see that many Asian Americans are earning less than the median in our region. But if you combine the Asian Americans um, of our region into one group, as we typically do with data, you'll get this purple bar which shows a median income that's actually higher than the region. So here we can see that by combining Asian Americans into one group, we're essentially masking the experience of many of our lower income Asian American communities. As the region becomes increasingly diverse, the systemic racism and disparate impacts experienced by people of color that I've just highlighted for you will become increasingly important 
for the overall health of our region and our ceiling for regional success. So here you can see about a quarter of the region's population was represented by people of color in 2000. That number jumped up to almost a third in 2010 and surpassed 40% by the time 2021 rolled around. Additionally, you can also see that we now have 15 cities that are now majority minority populations in our region. And as you all are well aware, uh, you're representing more and more people of color. So it's extremely important that we're addressing the needs and the barriers that they're facing. So I have a question related to this topic. Um, before you, sh you share the results uh, for this question, Catherine, um, uh, I say, I guess, um, can you add that to everyone's screen, Catherine? I'm sorry, I, I misspoke. So if we could add that question to everyone's screen, that'd be great. My question to you is, uh, what percent of the region's population will be people of color in 2050? Just take a guess. And some numbers are coming in. All right. I think we're almost getting there. Got a wide variety of results. Before you share those results, Catherine, uh, it seems like everyone's had a chance to respond. I think we got almost everybody. So let's find out what the uh, answer is on the next slide. And I'll share that with you all now. The answer is 56%. Uh, so let's see how many people got that right. Go ahead and share those for everybody, Catherine. So it looks like the vast majority of people, not the vast majority, the majority of people said uh, 50 to 54%, uh, behind that 55 to 59%, and then some people said more than 60%. So if you answered obviously 55 to 59%, you were correct. So we will be living in a region that is majority people of color by the time 2050 rolls around. So thank you for answering that survey question. And despite uh, what some may think, addressing the needs of this growing portion of our population does not come at the expense of our white residents in our region. In fact, the opposite is true. Failing to address the needs of people of color hurts all of us. Our regional success is not some zero sum game where one group's gain is another group's loss. As I've mentioned before, research has shown that when we have equitable policies, they can expand access to resources, which can expand access to opportunities such as new jobs from innovative ideas. Racial barriers are essentially leading to a loss of this innovation. Raj Chitty refers to this as lost Einsteins that are causing us to miss out on these innovative ideas and an expansion of opportunity throughout the region as a result of that missed opportunity. Structural racism is also causing us to be less resilient as a disproportionate number of our BIPOC residents continue to fall through the cracks during this pandemic. And as you all are well aware, failing to address this will only lead to a slow and incomplete recovery. Those who subscribe with what is referred to as the scarcity myth often also subscribe to universal strategies. Universal strategies are essentially colorblind. They use the same approach, regardless of your racial back background, failing to account for the structural racism that we've reviewed today. When we leave race off the table, the differences that people experience in relation to institutions and structures because of their race never get addressed. Conversely, targeted universalism establishes universal goals for every resident while developing targeted policies to address their unique circumstances in our region. It does this by using an equity lens, accounting for the historical and present context, pushing to create desired outcomes for those that are most impacted and most marginalized. It's also anti-racist. It names, frames, and operates using a racial equity lens, changing policies, changing institutions, changing structures to achieve positive outcomes for everyone. So uh, targeted universalism can be accomplished by taking the following steps that you see on this slide, step one, you're going to set a universal goal. So for instance, you might say, we don't want any families to be cost burdened or spend more than 30% of their income on housing. Step two, you're going to measure the how the overall population fares related to this goal. How many families are currently cost burdened? Step three, you'll measure the performance of different population segments. How many Native American families are cost burdened? How many Latinx families are cost burdened? African-American families. Step four, evaluate how structures are impeding the progress 
of these different routes toward that universal goal? What barriers are leading our Latinx families to be cost burdened? Same thing for Native American families, so forth and so on. And then step five, you're going to implement targeted strategies so that each group can achieve that goal. What are some of the best practices that we've seen across the country? Let's put those in place to reduce the likelihood that our Black families will be cost burdened in the future. Same thing for other groups as well. So the key to targeted universalism is to recognize the unique barriers that marginalized communities face and then develop strategies tailored to their needs. So here we can see on the left side of this slide, there's barriers leading or limiting the progress of the orange stick figure, uh, barriers leading to limited progress for the blue stick figure. And on the right side of the slide, we can see that there's some unique strategies symbolized by different color arrow, arrows that are helping each of our stick figures navigate around their unique barriers to achieve that universal goal. The racial equity impact assessment is one of the many resources that we're offering under the umbrella of the regional equity strategy at PSRC it has targeted universalism woven all throughout it and includes questions such as what does the data tell us about disparities between different groups so here the user will be encouraged to measure the performance of different population groups sounds familiar like step three that we had here. It will also include questions such as what has your engagement process told you about the burdens or benefits for different groups. So here you'll hear from community about what structures are impeding their progress toward the goal, very similar to step four that we saw here. And then lastly, uh, it includes questions such as what are your strategies for advancing racial equity? So encouraging the user of this resource to develop strategies, best practices that address those issues, which is similar to step five. So additionally, as you all are well aware, as we began Vision 2050, um, that, that update, we, we regularly heard from our boards, we heard from our committees, we heard from our stakeholders that equity needed to be a priority focused area of the plan. And the result is that we have a document that has equity centered policies woven all throughout it, touching almost every issue area in the document, providing guidance on this topic of equity for our member jurisdictions. I think this has us set up quite well to take this targeted universalism approach. On the topic of housing, we have multi-county planning policies such as this one, noting that as a region, we should promote home ownership opportunities for low income, moderate income, and middle income families and individuals, recognizing the historic inequities and in access to home ownership opportunities for communities of color. We also have our regional housing strategy that will serve as a playbook for our members on how we can accomplish this in a coordinated manner. On the topic of the economy, we have multi-county planning policies such as this one, noting that we should identify potential physical, economic, and cultural displacement of existing businesses using a range of strategies to mitigate displacement impacts. Additionally, we have our regional economic strategy that can provide guidance to our members related to this topic. And on the topic of transportation, we have multi-county planning policies such as this one, noting that we should implement transportation programs and projects that provide access to opportunity while preventing impacts to people of color, people with low income, people with special transportation needs. And the regional transportation plan provides some guidance on what success can look like for our region related to this topic. So uh, I'll end with this key takeaway, structural racism, uh, as you will recall, multiple institutions interacting to systematically privilege white people and disadvantaged people of color. There have been a chain of discriminatory policies that unfortunately continue to cause race to predict life outcomes. And lastly, targeted universalism can combat this structural racism by focusing on addressing unique barriers so that race can no longer predict life outcomes. So I'll thank you for your time. I, I hope that this was informative. Um, if um, we could, I will now stop sharing my screen and I will pass it back to Kristen, who will move us off into our breakout rooms. All right, good to see some faces on the call.
we got cut off in our meeting, but we were having a great discussion. I hope you all were having a great discussion as well. Uh, we're going to use the remaining limited amount of time that we have to kind of check in with a few groups to, to see uh, what you were able to discuss. And so I think I'll start, if we could, uh, with our in-person group. Do we have some? Yeah. I end, thank you, Charles. This is Robin Kosky. I ended up taking the notes for our group, so I think I can summarize a little bit of what we talked about um, in terms of you know what we what wasn't necessarily known or recognized or what was impactful. Um, I think our group mentioned that they weren't necessarily aware of. They may have been aware of the Homestead Act and some mm -hmm. of the things that happened with Asian Americans, um, but they weren't really completely aware of the magnitude of mm -hmm. the policies uh, and the way that this training sort of coalesced all that um, kind of helped people make some connections that were very important. Um, I think that there was also um, some focus on the importance of disaggregating Asian populations. Mm -hmm. um, and then just really thinking about the wealth creation that property ownership uh, really does bring. Um, and that, you know, kind of moving into the second question that we need to think about how we um, can address that with our policies and things that we're doing at PSRC and in all of our uh, jurisdictions around the region. Um, we also, in getting into the second question around what racial disparities we see in our work, we talked quite a bit about sound transit um, and many of the things that come out of that, including you know, some of the displacement around the station areas caused by rising property values. Um, the initial track placement, um, particularly in, in the air community south of Seattle that are right through BIPOC communities that have a lot of negative impacts. Um, and then just when we got into talking a little bit about how um, gentrification isn't actually a market action. So it's very difficult to change with law. You can't just appeal, repeal something to address it. Um, so, and then for the final question, um, we talked a little bit about state legislative action to possibly address condo laws um, as a way to make sure we're able to do home ownership. Um, and I think Mayor Erickson ended on a very positive note just to recognize that it's really important that we're having this conversation. Absolutely. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing, Robin. Uh, I think I'll go to uh, group number one. Oh, was group number one the, the in-person group? If so, I can go to group number two. Good. Okay, I'll go to group number two. Do we have someone reporting out for group number two? Peter, is that our group? <laughs> I wasn't sure. Our yeah. yeah, you got it, Bill. It's okay, our group. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. I'm Bill Dowling from the Olympic Workforce Development Council. We had a, a really interesting uh, I think conversation really uh, good dynamic going. I, I have to say we agree pretty much on our first question of the same things that were rather surprising to us. Certainly the impact of the Homestead Act. And I think we also were really surprised about Tacoma. I don't think we'd heard that example before. Mm -hmm. um, so that was really interesting right in our backyard. I mean, we'd heard other cities in the area, but but still. And then again, focusing what was just mentioned about wealth creation really tied to property ownership and how that continues to be an issue. Um, what racial disparities do we see in our work? You know, policies focused on centers kind of shifted with our Vision 2050. We need to get comfortable, we really said, around um, naming structural and institutional mm -hmm. racism, you know, making sure that that is. Um, we had some discussion around transit, how that's been altered. Is it is it continued to to move in the new routes and such? Is it, is it helping with the situation, or are we still continuing um, in some uh, bad opportunities or are not taking full advantage of opportunities we should? Initial track placement through BIPOC neighborhoods. Um, displacement as a result of of rising property values. You know, we talk about gentrification. Uh, is a market action, you know, d difficult to change with the law, just as we mentioned. And then finally, as a board member, some ideas were really, you know, state legislative action um, to really around allowing for condos was a discussion. And then uh, important that we're having, just important that we're having this conversation and to be committed to difficult mm -hmm. conversations continuing. Very well said. Thank you for sharing. Appreciate it. Um, I think my group was group number three, uh, so I will report out for us. Um, I think a lot of folks shared the same sentiment that they were not as aware about the Tacoma method, um, not as aware um, about, um, I think that one was really interesting as well as the 
when you're disaggregating the data, particularly around Asian Americans and the uh, unmasking that can happen about what disparities that we're seeing around that by just disaggregating that data. And there was an interest in not only doing that for Asian Americans, but also African Americans as well, disaggregating them from African immigrants um, and just kind of seeing disparities that you might see that could be a little bit different and kind of unveil what the what barriers are in place for those communities. So that was really interesting. Glad we had that conversation. Um, also, there was some interest in uh, as far as racial disparities, looking more at affordable housing was really important. Homelessness was really important. Those are disparities that we're seeing all across our region. So I'll stop there and I'll move us along to group number four. Anyone want to report out for group number four? Yeah, Charles, I'll report for group number four. Remember, Bacchus had to to head out. Same okay. same sentiments in the first one. Um, some little addition is it's kind of shocking to us how recently black residents couldn't buy a home. So it's mm -hmm. it's one of these things you think it's several way in the past and it's not as far in the past as you think it is. Um, and another comment that came up is it's um, sort of sad how um, many of these things have been celebrated. You think about the the West and you think about homesteading and this kind of positive idea of people coming out and getting land and this that we've, we've actually have been celebrating um, this very overt racist history. Mm -hmm. um, sort of following on some of the things that we heard, um, I won't add a bunch more because I know we're limited on time. It was really interesting when you talk about displacement, um, there's a lot of focus on housing displacement. It was a really interesting conversation in our group about also consider businesses and the displacement of businesses, especially when you think of small businesses are generally owned by people of color and women. And so, mm -hmm. so don't just focus on the housing side of displacement. Um, and also just a really interesting one about, you know, as we try to work and connect with larger groups, the capacity of people that we want to work with can be somewhat limited. There are smaller groups and it, it's finding that connection. And I thought a big, um, point that came out several times throughout was um, it's also important to look who's missing currently in our community. If you just talk to people who are in your community, especially if you have a small group of people, you're not hearing from the voices. You had that stat that we're going to be over half of, you know, more minority population in the future. If you just focus on residents that you're currently talking to now, you're not planning and understanding um, the needs of the people who will live here and what people need. Absolutely. Sounds like you all had a great conversation. Thanks for sharing, Craig. Uh, I'll move us along to group number five. Group number five was my group. Um, I'd love to open it up to that group. I'll just share a couple of things that um, was kind of interesting from uh, maybe next steps for PSRC. My group talked a lot about how it could be interesting to help distribute trainings like this to, um, you know, staff workers and planning commission individuals to really kind of help broaden that base of fundamental understanding. They also talked about how it was a really opportune time to start having these conversations since we're, um, you know, in the thick of our comprehensive plan updates. Um, but yeah, I'll open it up to my group if anyone else wants to add. Anyone else like to share from group number five? Actually, I'll add one thing because um, I, I will just say maybe as a continuous improvement idea, um, what I didn't notice on the homesteading was they were donated land. We didn't really talk about indigenous and, you know, there's a lot of effects from the, the tribes that are here that have been impacted and whether that could be lifted up more. And I do think that there's a bit more about our Japanese internment history that could be also lifted up. and. I think it just helps create that broader understanding and then how we actually share that broadly so that if we, when our community doesn't understand, then it's really hard to actually move them to where we need to go to address the disparities. Thanks. Very well said. So couldn't agree more. I think uh, the more that we can dive into the nuances of uh, this history, the better and gives us a better understanding of what we need to do to address the root causes of the disparities that we're continuing to grapple with to this day. Uh, anyone else? Can I add on one point? Uh, Councilmember James Zam brought up. Uh, I think one of the things that people talk about is Tacoma method. Uh, very few, you know, there's one uh, history that very few people know about. I think we need to bring those up. Like you said, address the root reason, the root problem, and then mm -hmm. maybe we can solve the problem. The problem with our history, people specifically that are affected and still affecting us. Thanks. Well said. So we have a hand raised. Right? I could take that. Hey. So it's not something I brought up in the meeting <clears throat> in our group, but it's something I think is important because, uh, especially in the context of PSRC and the mm -hmm. regional focus that PSRC has, um, 
I think it's easy for each city to sort of look at where we're moving the needle on equity and racial equity and where we may not be. Um, so, and given that PSRC, one of the roles that, um, that I think you all play is uh, really look, bringing the data together about the region. Mm -hmm. I would say um, maybe even strengthening that and uh, maybe a next click stop on that would be um, having the data uh, that shows for each, and you may, sorry if you do, uh, shows where each member city Mm -hmm. or jurisdiction is when it comes to mm -hmm. uh, the topics that we talked about today um, and bringing more of that outcome focus to the discussion. Um, I, I think sometimes we end up in our echo chamber and, and want to celebrate successes, but when we look at it in a regional context, we're not where we should be. Absolutely. Fantastic point. That is something that we uh, have been exploring uh, with a resource under the umbrella of the regional equity tracker, our regional equity strategy, our equity tracker. So looking to dive into uh, getting more nuanced data for each of our members in the future, that's something that's on the horizon maybe uh, later on. But um, definitely we've heard that before, and I think it's extremely important that we continue to hear that, that there's an interest in having that data. So thank you for sharing. Uh, I guess I will move us along to group number six. And we want to share from group number six. Charles, I believe all of our groups have shared out. Oh, okay, great. Fantastic. Well, it was fantastic um, uh, working with you all this morning. Thank you again for making the time. I have one brief announcement that I would like to share with you. If you give me one second, I can find that. Kristen wanted me to make sure I let you know that we have an upcoming post survey. Uh, this will really help us capture any feedback, which you liked, which you didn't like from today's survey, or from today's presentation, so that we can make improvements for our next presentation, which will be held in March, that will cover something known as Affirm Counter Transform, also known as ACT. It is a communication tool that is used for having conversations around race like this. How can you have more effective conversations around race? So looking forward to having that conversation in March of 2023. If you have some time, please fill out our survey. We'd love to hear what you thought about today's presentation. Um, with that, I will let you enjoy the rest of your Wednesday. It was great seeing you all, and I will see you all soon. Take care.